If you're looking for the perfect training program or you've been following random workouts or even have no plan at all when you go to the gym, this episode is for you. What if I told you that the difference between mediocre and exceptional results often comes down to following a well-structured program consistently and tracking the right metrics to make sure you're actually making progress. Today, I'm sitting down with the founder of Boost Camp, Michael Liu, who's also a strength athlete and is revolutionizing how lifters translate complex evidence-based training principles into real-world results in the gym. Whether you're frustrated with confusing or ineffective programs, you're tired of program hopping, or you're ready to take your training to the next level based on your personal performance and data, this episode will show you how proper programming and tracking can help your gains take off. Welcome to Wits and Weights, the podcast that blends evidence and engineering to help you build smart, efficient systems to achieve your dream physique. I'm your host, Philip Pape, and today I've invited Michael Liu on the show to show you how to combine the use of technology with evidence-based training. Now, Michael is a serious lifter, like I try to be, who's pulled 600 pounds off the floor and understands the importance of proper programming. His app, Boost Camp, has rapidly gained traction by giving you access to effective training programs for coaches who we all know and love in the evidence-based space, like Eric Helms, Alex Bromley, Greg Knuckles, and Alberto Nunez, and combining that with a clean design and workout analytics. And you know how much I love data. Today, you'll learn how to find a program that works, implement proven training principles more effectively, track the metrics that actually matter for progress, and optimize your training using that data. Plus, as someone who personally uses Boost Camp for my own training and my clients, I'm really excited to ask Michael about how the technology works and what the future holds so you can identify, track, and customize your program to build more strength and size than ever before. Michael, thanks for doing this and coming on the show, my man. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your podcast, Philip. Yeah, and uh, you and I connected a while back. I think you'd reached out about being an affiliate, and I said, what is this new lifting app that, that claims to be the best app for lifters? And I tried it out, and I use it now, which is awesome, right? I use it now, and my clients use it, a whole bunch of folks I've definitely referred to the app. So today, we're going to try not to make it an, yeah, we're not going to make it an infomercial, but just so people know who are listening, you know, I use it myself, and I think it's a great technology. So I want to ask you, if you went back in time and gave yourself boost camp when you first started lifting, what would that have done for your approach to training and your results? Wow, that's an <laughs> interesting question. I mean, I would definitely be, you know, 10 times stronger than I'm now, probably be a world <laughs> champion powerlifter by now, competing in the IFBB pros probably as well. <laughs> I, you would be, man, right there next to Eric, right? <laughs> uh, no, but all, all jokes aside, I would say probably would have made more consistent progress when I first started lifting was back in the early to late 2000s. And that's when starting strength was very popular. Mm -hmm. But I would say the science-based fitness hasn't really caught on yet. So besides starting strength, people were still on the bodybuilding.com MISC forums, uh, you know, putting out random splits and routines. And mostly I was trying a bunch of different things and really just program hopping and wasting mm -hmm. my time. So I think if I had more structure in place, better access to incredible cultures that is on the on Boost Camp and also just on the internet now, I think it would have definitely made a lot more progress. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. A lot of us have been through a similar journey. Even though I started lifting later, it still took me 10 years to find starting strength or the muscle and strength pyramids or any of these things. And one of the most common questions I get from clients is like, what are people in general, what app should I use to track my workouts? And the fact that you can take a program in an app, find it, follow it, and all for free, I think that's powerful because that kind of connects two things that are often separated, right? Like I need to go find a program so I get lost on the internet and I download some old Google Sheet program from somebody. I have to figure it out. I have no idea what I'm doing versus hey, jump right into Alex Bromley's Bull Mastiff like I just did a week ago and you could customize it as needed, but you could just start. So is that why you started Boost Camp? Because you saw that need in the industry or like what's the story behind it? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, that's exactly right. So my partner, uh, Patricia, she's the engineer and okay. she's really the brain behind Boost Camp. But my background is actually in finance. So I'm quite familiar with using spreadsheets for work before we started building Boost Camp. But the one thing that I noticed was, you know, as the fitness enthusiast amongst my 
friend circle, anytime someone will ask me for a workout program, I'll be like, oh, hey, check out the spreadsheet, Ensign's 531 spreadsheet, where mm -hmm. it's, you're going to make great progress. And uh, the most common response I get is, uh, I'm not going to follow a spreadsheet to go to the gym on my mobile phone. So that's really where, to your point, the genesis of Boost Camp came from, is to make workout programs more accessible okay. so that people can actually follow them and make progress without needing to, you know, fondle with an Excel sheet on their laptop or bring a, like a, you know, or trying to open Google Sheets on their phone. Yeah, and it makes sense. And I think there are apps out there that get part of the way there. For example, and you know, I'm probably going to drop some of your competitors as we go through this, but I oh, used right. Train Heroic for a long time through a coach that I had, but you have to be a coach kind of paying into that and then the client can access it or you have to pay for a program if you're a client. So it looks like you came in and disrupted that by offering the programs, high quality vetted from really good coaches for free. And then, you know, there's premium features you could upgrade to on the app that are like the, the added value once you get into that ecosystem. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah. I mean, okay. we used to get, so before we launched better premium features, we used to get people who complain and say that, oh, like the premium version of Boostcam kind of sucks. Okay. And the reason is because we give away the best features of the app, which is the ability to follow tons of amazing programs for free. So the way I kind of describe it is like, you're going to a restaurant and you get the steak for free, but you have to pay for the ketchup. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Um, you have to pay for the potatoes. I mean, at least that's what Boost Camp was like before, where we give away so many features for free and we still do. And frankly, I think that's important because, you know, our mission is to make science-based fitness more accessible, to make training more accessible for anybody, not just people who can afford it. So, you know, to your point, we have tons of workout programs that are completely free to use on the app. People can create their own programs for free mm -hmm. on the app as well, or they can just track workouts like a simple workout tracker. So we give away all these features for free so that, you know, we actually help people get stronger and reach their fitness goals. And, you know, if they find the app useful, many people just want to support us regardless of whether they actually need the premium, the premium features or not. So yeah. that's really how we think about the business is not just from a financial pr perspective. It really started as a pet project for us to, you know, make some moves in the space. Yeah, it makes sense. A, the kind of passion before profit and then it all aligns exactly. once we're closely and, and ethically and you feel good about yourself, I imagine, doing it that way. And I'm happy to, to tell people about it because, for example, you mentioned custom programs. A lot of people get frustrated with how difficult it is to just make your own next session or workout. And not only can you do that, you can do it on desktop, which is another people are like, oh, cool, you can do it on desktop, which is like I could sit down and create a 16 week, very complicated program if you want it, you know, in like 30 minutes on a desktop. But I, I want to talk about those programs a bit because the listeners are like, OK, well, fine, you have a bunch of programs. What do they look like? Well, you've partnered with a bunch of some of the most respected names in the industry. I already mentioned a few in the intro, and I know you've had some of them on your podcast as well. Like, what have you learned from them? Because you and I were talking about how you bring people on to learn from them on your podcast. What have you learned that makes a program actually effective versus, you know, it just looks good on paper like a million others that are out there? Yeah, I get questions all the time from users on Reddit and over email. What is the best workout program? Okay. And I think... <laughs> You know, the right question is, what is the perfect workout program for you? Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure you know, as a coach yourself, everybody is different. People have different life constraints. People have different goals. Some people are injured. So the perfect program really depends on the specific person. So the one thing that we try to do on Boost Camp is to have lots of different programs cater to different goals, whether your main goal is general strength training, bodybuilding, competitive powerlifting, at home fitness. Uh, so different goals. Uh, how many, we have filters for how many days you want to train. So we have programs for three days a week, four days a week, even seven days a week. Programs for different equipment access. So some people only have body weight, only have a pull-up bar. Some people have access to a home gym with um, only barbells and a few dumbbells. And some people have entire access of, uh, you know, like a commercial, full commercial gym. So by having all these different goals, different filters, and also different levels, depending if you're a beginner, novice, intermediate, or advanced, you can really find the right program for yourself. And I think that is the most important factor between what is considered like a good program for you and versus not. 
Now, with, with that being said, there's definitely a contrast between good programs and bad programs. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, back in the early 2010s, there were a lot of really bad programs on the internet. Programs where you know, you're doing 20 different exercises per day, or you're doing deadlifts after doing a bunch of isolation exercises. Programs that generally would kill you from having way too much workload, but actually doesn't help you make progress. And that's why I think, you know, we only try to partner with really, really try to partner with science-based coaches that not only are very knowledgeable from a science perspective, but also have a lot of field experience training clients as well mm-hmm. to design programs that are actually good. So the foundation of the programs are good. And then it's up to the user themselves to figure out like what is the right program for them. Right. And definitely rely on those filters pretty heavily. And then once you go into the program, you could see the description of it and and kind of the why behind that. For someone who's been program hopping and ready to just pick a program, is there any advice you give them when they do that filter for the first time? Because I could imagine you'd still be overwhelmed, right? You still pick all these filters and then you have like eight programs to choose from. Mm. What would you recommend? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a tough problem. And frankly, it's something that I don't think we've, we've fully solved because like yeah. you said, right, we have so many programs on the app now by coaches and uh, there's also thousands of programs o- uploaded by users as well. Oh, the community, so yeah. even if you use all the filters, you might still get eight programs. So I guess like ultimately how you pick that, honestly, I, I don't have a great answer. I mean, I'm curious on, you know, from your perspective as a coach, like what would you recommend? Yeah. I mean, I think one answer is you won't know until you try. (laughs) Like that's one answer is unless you're, you really know yourself like a late intermediate or advanced lifter, many programs can work. And I would, I would just look at the workouts. Like you can hop in and you can see, okay, this is 18 week program, kind of jump ahead and see what the lifts, the movements are. Look at the volume. We were joking about bull mastiff, how it has like a massive ramp up in volume. And if that's not something you're going to stick with right now, maybe another program's right for you. And and there's also a description in there. Like I know Brian Borstein, he was on the show and he has a hybrid program in there. So like there's special interests people might have, you know, mm. improving conditioning. So yeah, I would say just experiment. And, and we'll get to later. I wanted to ask you some about like AI and technology in the future. Maybe there's other ways to, to get there. But here's a fun question. Like what's the most bizarre program or like maybe it's a community program because you don't want to throw any of your coaches under the bus <laughs> that you've seen like created in the app. I don't know if you that's something you track. And that worked well, you know, like a bizarre program. Have you ever seen something like that? Oh my God. If, so <laughs> we launched the community program feature in January of this year. And now there's been, I think there's over 3000 programs now that have been published by users. What's crazy is you can actually find thousands of users. You can, cause you can see the number of athletes on each program. Okay. And even for the community programs, you can find programs with thousands of users on them. And there's definitely some like, super niche programs that have done really well that's like super random we frankly had to take down some programs that are like inappropriate okay you know if they have different you know like 18 plus type of graphic okay. obviously you have to take stuff like that down sure. but the one program that's done really well that uh sort of in a field that we haven't really thought about is a stretching program which i think might be the most popular community program right now and it's like a 10 minute stretching routine which I think is really smart because, you know, at some point the programs do become saturated, right? Because there's so many programs out there now on Bootcamp and a stretching program really benefits uh, any single strength training program you do. And it's definitely very important for just general health and preventing injuries. So I think that program, you know, it's a really smart program. I'm just taking a look now at some other ones. There's like a basic grip, grip routine okay, for grip training that, uh, you know, has done really well. There's one called Shy Girls Get Fit with 800 athletes on it. I mean, I recommend you check out the community program section of the website because you'll find a ton of interesting programs uploaded by users with just like the most random names and graphics, but somehow they really attract like the, the exact audience for that program. You know, I love that, right? Like the stretching, I could see why now you're going to have a whole bunch of people listening to this podcast go in and create stretching programs because they don't grab attention. But I could see that uh, that these kind of niche supportive type workouts like grip training could be for improving your deadlift or for strongman or, you know, uh, the jungle gym style. Like, I don't I forget the name, but, you know, the ninja style training and stuff like that. 
I know data is a big part of this app. On the back end, are you able to collect some sort of information or data, not private data, obviously, but just patterns from the community workouts right now? Like, are you, you know, without revealing, you know, any, any trade secrets or anything, are you able to analyze that in any way? Because it's a big source of potential information on how people think about programming. Yeah, to be honest, we haven't been able to focus too much on the analytics side of the programming yet at uh, a very in-depth detail level. Mm -hmm. I would say the type of analysis that we ran have shown, for example, programs that are three days a week tend to have like the highest retention, you know, for people to stay on the programs. Oh, that's good. We, we actually ran a pretty interesting analysis mm -hmm. over a year ago on the most popular programs. Uh, we did run a pretty interesting analysis a while back, just comparing the starting one rep maxes for users on different programs at an aggregate level versus other programs. I can share you a link where we share the findings with the community afterwards. Uh, but that was like a one-time exercise that I thought it was pretty cool because mm -hmm. you know how like when you go to Reddit and you search program reviews, you'll find a lot of anecdotal evidence for yes. programs. And oftentimes the most brutal programs that people actually stick to end up having the best results, but it doesn't right. necessarily mean it's the best program for the general population. So by able to see the starting one round maxes and the drop-offs across different weeks, you can really see some interesting analysis on, okay, what programs create the best results, but also have the highest retention so that people can actually follow through, through with them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really great point because we talk about sustainability and in, in all this stuff, nutrition as well. And I could, I could see two, two curves intersecting, one being like how effective it is for driving up your 1RM and one being how effective it is that you're going to stick with it. Where's the sweet spot, right? <laughs> Where's the sweet spot for like the average person? And so maybe you have a filter like how gritty are you with sticking to really hard programs, you know, on a scale of one to five and then like based on your, you know, level of pain that you're willing to suffer, you know, not, not really to, to make it sound that way. It would give you the right program. That's a really great point. Cause we were joking again about the program I'm running now. And I, when you look at the reviews, you'll see a lot of folks are like, I got three weeks in and then they post their review. Like you got to give it more time <laughs> and then we'll see. Yeah. All right. So we should, really, yeah, we yeah. should consider changing that. I mean, we prompt users to give a review about three to four weeks in and then, okay. you know, they can choose not to leave a review. But yeah, I mean, the reviews really become more helpful like later on, right? If for people to actually stick onto the program. But then at the same time, if a program is too hard and most people are dropping off on week three, that probably means that the program, you know, might not be the best program for a lot of people. So it's hard to say. Yeah, the weird ones are the ones where they're like five stars. I'm three weeks in. This looks like it'd be great for growing my legs. And it's like a, a wishful statement as if like, but they're not going to continue, you know? Yeah. Uh, but for you watching, you know, looking at the app, it could be great. No, it's pretty cool. I, I mean, I love analytics. I know we can always go overboard, like overanalyzing data. But I did, I did want to understand how the basic analytics available, such as sets per week or any other metrics that you think are helpful. Let me put it this way: What are the top? What's the top one or two types of analytics people maybe should look at that informs their training and maybe any modifications they should make? Yeah. I mean, I think people should, I mean, your question is around how you should track your progress, really. And I think that actually goes beyond the app. At the first level, I would say, you know, if your goal is weight loss or bulking, uh, you should look at the scale. So, <laughs> you know, that's probably the most important factor, you know, you should look at. And then followed by probably the mirror as well, although that can vary depending on lighting, how you feel and all that kind of stuff as well. But beyond those two very obvious and important factors in the app itself, I would say at the workout level, it's really helpful to just look at the weights and reps that you completed, you know, from your previous workouts, right? That's the most obvious thing that I think any basic app should be able to offer. Mm -hmm. So being just even tracking, even for me, someone who's been lifting for over a decade, I find just being able to track how many reps I did, you know, across my three sets um, of lat pull down or any single exercise just really helps me remember my progress. So if I know last week I did 12 reps, then maybe for this week, I'll try to do 13 reps, right? And if I'm at the top of my range, maybe I'll try to increase the weight. So just being able to see that progress over time from the number of, uh, number of sets you're doing and the weight that you're doing and the reps, it's just like 
super critical, I think. Yeah. And then if you have the basics down like that, then I would say some other analytics that we now provide in the app that's very interesting. You can see your total workout volume over time. So tonnage? Your tonnage. Okay. Yep. So you can see how that changes uh, throughout the year. You know, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Then you can analyze, oh, okay, like how's my body weight also training during this period? Mm -hmm. How's my results trending, right? Because more volume doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, you know this better than I do. Mm -hmm. More volume isn't always better and less volume is always better. There's a lot of variables, you know, in that. So it's very, it's something that you really need to think through. And then some other analytics that we offer in the app that I find to be quite bespoke to Bootcamp is the muscle engagement tracker. Okay. So I'm sure you've seen this as the, um, at the end of every workout. And if you go to the analytics tab, you'll see this, you know, big muscle guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. The sets, you... the sets that you targeted each muscle. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Love that it. feature yeah. was so Eric Helms and Bryce Lewis helped us develop um, this feature. And it's super cool because it shows you your actual volume done by muscle group. Mm -hmm. And uh, the volume is actually calculated based on effective volume. So for example, when you do a set of bench press, you're using your chest, your front delts, and your, your triceps. triceps. Mm -hmm. So, but you're not using the muscle hundred percent, you know, for the entire exercise, right? So you might be, it might, your effective volume might be hundred percent chest. I can't remember the exact breakdown. But, you know, we have it by hundreds of exercises that's calculated, that's inputted by with the help of Bryce and, and Eric for that. But it could be like 100% chest, could be 60% front delts and 80% your triceps. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and then we, we do that for like every single exercise that you do. So by having it broken down in detail and being able to see that over weeks, you can actually calculate and see the volume that you're performing for each muscle group over time, which I think that's a very good indica indicator of whether you're under training a muscle, over training a muscle. Um, even for me, when I see it, I'm like, oh, okay, like I'm not doing, I'm like, I'm not doing a lot of work on my rear delts, or I'm not doing a lot of work on my calves. And, uh, you know, you can use that to... I was going to say calves. That's, that's the one that often comes up. Calves, it's like yeah, at the bottom, right? skip calves. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so man. that's a really cool feature, I think, in terms of analytics at a deeper level for um, you know people that are interested. I agree. That's one of the ones I look at a lot only because it, it prompts you at the end of the workout and then at the end of the week, there's like a weekly report. And on a program where volume is changing as part of the progression, it helps to see that, okay, my quad sets are actually going up, you know, they go up a third and then a third and then they drop back. And we know from the evidence, right, that, and this constantly is getting refined, but Jeff Alberts was on the show and kind of confirmed it again, you know, godfather of natural bodybuilding that 10 to 20 sets is generally recommended as pretty solid for a, a good training program, but you could get effective an effective workout as low as five to 10, you know, depending on how hard you're training and what you respond to. And then the idea of variation throughout the year is helpful too, because you mentioned looking at your volume, cumulative volume over the year. I think that's helpful as well if you need to vary it up. If you're like, I've gone through a six month high volume phase, now I'm going to go through a six month low volume phase. Like you said, it's not necessarily high or low that's better. It might be that you need high and then you need low <laughs> to get the response. So yeah. I'm just kind of playing off that as how helpful that kind of data can be for folks. Yeah. I actually yeah. had a pretty interesting chat with Eric about this where, um, uh, cause I was, I was about to start a cut after a pretty serious powerlifting and bulking phase. And I was asking him, is it possible to gain muscle on a cut? Because uh, the general consensus, I guess, is you can't, but the answer is actually a lot more nuanced. So it's possible if you're a beginner at certain muscle groups. Mm -hmm. So for example, right, I was okay. doing power thing for like two years, like pretty seriously, like only squat, bench and deadlift. So I never really seriously worked my, my shoulders. I mean, rear delts, like I feel like that's something that I'm definitely still a beginner at. So if I focus my program on providing more training volume towards my delts, as opposed to muscles that I'm already pretty advanced at, like my back and my chest, perhaps, I could actually make muscular progress during my cut. And by using the muscle volume tracker, I'm able to look at how my volume is, is distributed during my cut to focus more on underdeveloped muscle groups where I can actually make progress. Oh, that's awesome. That is, that's actually perfect timing. I was talking to a lifter friend of mine last week about, can you get newbie gains when you're not a newbie? And we were talking about that idea exactly. of like, 
there's aspects of your development and the way you train that are new or, you, or you've detrained. Like if you've been doing powerlifting for a long time, you might be detrained with a lot of other muscles because you haven't hit them through a hypertrophy workout. So for those listening, like this is awesome, right? It's, it's be smart about when you go on a cut and what kind of program you follow. That might be the perfect time to go after an underdeveloped muscle group because assuming you don't go more than like 500 calorie deficit, because that's, I think, an, a decent cutoff in the literature of where it, it becomes really hard to, to build new muscle. Keep it moderate and go after targeted muscle groups that are weak spots. That's a great tip, man. That's good. So back to, you were talking about like 531 and, you know, there's other programs that if you're kind of a newer lifter, they're a little bit complicated. You don't quite understand with the undulation and the block periodization and all that. How does the app, for example, make them more approachable, you know, without, without like oversimplifying, like still make it the actual program? How would you say they do that? Yeah. Well, the, the beauty is the app first, uh, as you mentioned earlier, has an overview section where we explain in detail the structure of the program, the philosophy behind the program. And you can also scroll over if you go to the website or if you go to the program structure section of the program, you can see how the program looks week by week mm -hmm. with you know, the different exercises, the sets, the percentages uh, for each week. So you can still get the high level overview, but where it really keeps things simple for the user is you click start program, onboard program, and then you just enter your one RAM access and it calculates, it populates all your future weeks for you so that you don't have to do any jiggering and you don't have to figure out you know, how to use a spreadsheet you know, to make this program run for you automatically. So that's where we try to keep things understandable and mm -hmm. you know, especially for the beginning of the program, but also make it super simple for somebody who's not familiar with you know, the 531 structure to just click start, figure out their starting weights in which during the all two, we have like a one rep max calculator where they can enter the exercise and then it will, it will calculate the one rep max for them so that even if they don't they have never done one rep max before they can figure it out and then just start the workout because you know you don't want to the workout is already hard enough you don't want to be <laughs> fudging you don't want to make it harder <laughs> by you know trying to be a, a computer scientist to to work out a, to work a program yeah that's for somebody like me i get it and i'm like this is too easy i i used to have to spend 10 minutes at least walking around my house like fudging with my next workout now it's just like there <laughs> Oh, no, I had to find something else to do with my time. But uh, no, that's good. Yeah, and I, I noticed the program also has all the stuff people like, like RPE and, you know, percent 1RM and all the different types of ways like AMRAPs and such. So, you know, we don't have to get in all the features. Like somebody can go Google like Boost Camp and see all that. Rest timers, warm-up calculators, all that fun stuff's in there. What I was curious about, like I mentioned this earlier, what is the human element that is the hardest to replicate do you think that maybe isn't that maybe is in the program or isn't yet in the program that you're trying to that you would love to see in there? Yeah, that's a great question. While it's really difficult to replicate the personal connection that you get from a coach, I've had some really great coaching in the past where you know it's it's not just the programming that a coach provides for you, right? It's the mental support that you get from having somebody to cheer you on, to motivate you when you're when you have a bad workout when you miss a PR attempt. So that element is definitely something that uh, we don't yet have in Boost Camp that, um, you know, in an app format that you get, you know, from a, from a coach. You know, the things that we try to do to replicate a little bit of that, it's like, okay, we have streaks, you know, we're gonna have badges uh, in the future as well. We could launch community features. You know, we have all these data, you know, to try to keep people motivated, but you definitely, you're definitely missing that human element of motivation from just having a coach to uh, stay with you during the, during the tougher times. So that part I would say is pretty, you know, it's pretty hard to replicate, but it's also pros and cons, right? So if a coach, you know, if your choice is between getting a trainer at a gym pop gym, who, you know, I mean, I used to go to Equinox, it's like this fancy gym. And, you know, the first thing that the, I always see trainers get beginners to do the most complicated exercises, like a one hand mm. snatch or whatever. Right. But two, it's almost like you're, they're trying to confuse them to make them use a trainer. And yeah. Like you need, like you need me, you need me. This is so complicated. You need me. Right. Is that what you're you saying? Need me. Yeah, yeah. Cause like they don't want to lose yeah. a client. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, oftentimes I, you know, I find that, uh, you know, the clients don't make any progress over, 
a very long period of time. Whereas if they actually follow like a proven program from Bootcamp or from the internet from anywhere, like they would actually make a lot better results. So there's definitely pros and cons to having a coach. I mean, in the app, we definitely want to figure out more gamification elements to uh, you know, help people stay motivated in absence of a coach. Yeah, that's always a tough one, right? Because people want to balance. They don't want too many notifications popping up, getting in the way of their workouts. But at the same time, they want a reason to to go in. I mean, for me, the reason to go in is just get big and strong. And if you're following an effective program, it should do that for you. But anyway, oh man, what was I going to ask? Oh, so you mentioned some of the, you mentioned already a couple interesting findings or tips from other coaches you've worked with. I'm just curious if you have any more things like that where you've, since you started developing the app, you've added a feature or a way that it calculates information or what have you based on what these expert coaches have shared with you in working with them. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the programs that, so when we first launched the app, we were digitizing a lot of popular programs from the internet onto the app. And now as we work with coaches more and more to develop exclusive programs on the app. You know, you can think of like a Netflix special, but for, you know, a Boost Camp original type of thing. I like um, <laughs> um, but as we looked at, okay, what type of programs people love the most? What type of programs have the best retention? Are, you know, they're typically programs that change in structure over time. So instead of just having a program that looks the same week after week, there's elements of the program that changes. So for example, a 12-week program might be broken down into three phases of introductory uh, volume accumulation, intensification, or you know the reps and the RPEs or percentages, if they have percentages, change over time. Just having more progression in the program itself, you know, we found people generally um, like that a lot. And they tend to want to stick to the program instead of, it's almost like a, a freshness to it, right? That yes. instead of program hopping, they can still enjoy that freshness without having to switch the program and lose out on all the progression that they're, they will be making. So, you know, that's definitely a, a big one that, that we learned. Hey, just wanted to give a shout out to Philip and the services he offers over at Wits and Weights. Uh, where I personally worked with Philip for about eight months and we did two three month cuts during that time. And I lost a total of 33 pounds of scale weight and about five inches off my waist working with Philip. Uh, a few things I really enjoyed about working with Philip is number one, he's really taken the time to develop uh, a deep expertise in nutrition and also resistance training. So uh, he has that depth if you want to go deep on the whys with Philip, he has the chops to do that. Uh, but if also if you want to just kind of get some instruction and more practical advice and a plan on what you need to do, Philip's a great communicator. He can pull back and communicate at that level also. Uh, the other thing about Philip is that he is a lifter himself, so he's very familiar with the performance and body composition goals that most lifters have when they're looking for nutrition advice. And also Philip is, has engineer's brain and is trained in engineering. So what that means or, or what that has resulted in is that he has really uh, some very efficient systems set up and uses technology very efficiently to make the coaching experience uh, very easy and uh, uh, very efficient and works pretty much like clockwork. And you can really track your results and you will have real data at the, when you're done working with Philip, and also have access to some tools likely that you can continue to use uh, to uh, to really keep a handle on your nutrition. So if all that sounds uh, interesting to you, there's Philip, like all good coaches, has a ton of free information out there and really encourage you to go check out his podcast uh, or his Facebook page and see if he may be able to help you out. So thanks again, Philip. That is a very, very big one. And, and man, you're hitting on spots that I've personally been thinking a lot about lately. Mm. And we talked about 531. We talked about Bromley. You know, he loves base and peak phases. I've seen myself, like, if you if I'm just going to do the same lifts for week after week after week after week, I'm like, I need something di- just for my mental health. I need something different. Even if you're like, no, you just got to grind it out. You know, just, just keep doing sets of five forever, right? I'm like, well, as a human, it's not going to work. So um, I think that's, that's big. And it's important for people to understand that that sense of variety 
itself is a, a driver of growth. Like, you know, mm. the fact that you have, like you said, different rep ranges, different percentages, your body gets exposed to these things and that is a huge driver of growth. So I love that you mentioned that. And I think people should look for that when they're thinking of, can I stick with this program for like four months um, as opposed to having to hop around every four weeks to a new program because it's getting stale. So I love that. Yeah. Um, that's a good oh, one. One more thing I would mention yeah. too is just having more personalization elements in the app. So when we first started, we only had programs from coaches. And then we found that, okay, people want to be able to switch to different exercises, want to swap to their own exercises. Uh, you know, having that, being able to modify existing programs, we found to be very important. And then taking a bigger step is being able to create their own custom programs. So, I mean, generally for newer lifters, I don't recommend it. If they have a coach like yourself, you know, who's very knowledgeable, great, right? You can create a program for them in the app and send it to them to follow. Mm -hmm. But for general beginner, even novice lifters, I would recommend they stick to a pre-made program for them because uh, you don't know what you don't know. So you could be wasting your That's time right. thinking of the best program and you switch that every few weeks and at the end, you end up making no progress. But uh, having the program creator, I found to be another important feature in the app for people that are tired of following a program or they actually moved on to being an intermediate or advanced lifter and they want to follow their own programming. So having that feature, uh, you know, we also found to be a very important keystone feature in the app that uh, we didn't really think about when we first started uh, Boost Camp. And, and I'm very glad it's in there or else I, I wouldn't find it usable. Like me personally, because I need to swap things out. And when it comes to accessory lifts and equipment availability, it gives you a lot more flexibility and then you can swap it out and have it apply to future workouts, which I like, you know, you, once you swap it, it's like, do you want to keep this for the future ones? Yes. Let's do that. The thing about programming in general, I think what we're revealing through this conversation is, you know, programming itself is a skill and everybody needs a different entry point. And I think a good tool can help do that, whether it's boost camp or yeah, there's other tools, obviously, but kind of making it easy to jump in and do something effective. It's funny. You mentioned like, pre-made programs because sometimes people denigrate templates and programs but in reality i think most beginners can follow a number of templates just fine and make massive progress and not overthink it and then start to learn oh this works for me this doesn't let me tweak it and a i think a really good coach that comes in like if i have a new client that's never lifted before i'm probably going to get them on a very standard program it might be my template but it's still i'm not going to highly customize it because i have no clue how they're going to respond so if you're doing this for yourself and you like download boost camp, think of that, just get into it, have fun, try it out. And you'll know pretty quickly if it's for you. And if not, there's, there's a million other ways to do it. I want to ask you, I know there's a premium version and I've seen that there are some programs labeled as pro. What, what's the difference with those versus the free programs? Yeah. Well, as we launched so many free programs on the app, we are now, we still launch a lot of free programs uh, to be clear, but we now have premium only programs. So these are programs where we partner with a coach to deliver a lot more in-depth programming. So for example, in the uh, Paris Butler uh, Bot Dominating program, there's, he's written a really complex program, com easy to follow, but complex in terms of all the notes that he provides all the different change we talk about you know changes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. within a program you know he's programming progressions you know for every single week he's filming detailed instructional videos um you know to go along with the program so you can think of them as a way for us to offer almost like coaching in some ways mm -hmm. just you know, a lot more personalized programming to help people, you know, get the results they want. Yeah, that ties well with what we were saying before. And, and uh, I didn't realize the, you're right, the instructional videos can be customized because the, the default library, it's like, you know, you go to barbell back squat, it has kind of a silhouette animation of a back squat. And what you're saying is maybe there's more custom YouTube videos linked in there, wherever the video comes from in the, the pro programs. And again, for people listening, like there's a million, there, there's a ton of programs available for free. It's just, you may find others that you really want that are in pro. Even the one I'm following now, I'm a premium subscriber, but it's free because it's the one I wanted to follow. All right, man. Is there anything else you wanted to chat about regarding either the app or programming or lifting in general? You know, I didn't, I didn't bring you on here as like a lifting expert or a program expert. I'm definitely not. <laughs> but, but you've learned a lot, just like I have like through the grapevine and through your relationship. So is there anything else that 
you wish I had asked or you want people to understand about all of this, you know, maybe, maybe the future of where, where this technology is going or something else? Yeah, I mean, I would say we really listen to user feedback and we develop new features very quickly compared to, you know, a lot of other app developers. Uh, you know, we, we're very involved. Like I answer, you know, every single user email, you know, our subreddit, you know, I try to answer user questions and participate in community discussions. So all of the features and all the programs that we've developed on the app has been through community engagement and feedback from users uh, like yourself. So, you know, to the extent that anybody has any feedback for the app, you know, we're always listening and, uh, you know, willing to iterate and experiment and develop, you know, to make Bootcamp better. I guess from your perspective now, having used Bootcamp for, for quite a while for yourself, and you mentioned you've sent programs to your clients as well, like what, uh, you know, what's your experience being like and what do you wish that we had? Yeah, man, good, good, good way of turning it back on me. I mean, I mean, little things come up all the time as they always do. No app is perfect, right? There's always things. Man, probably when you customize an existing program, maybe just, just the interface being a little more intuitive, that's that's a minor thing. Like I, I was able to figure it out like less than a day. Obviously, it's figure outable. <laughs> but uh, all of these things can be like less taps, less confusion of how you do it. That That's the only thing that comes to mind because I think it's an amazing app. And again, I use it, so... But I love that you do that. Like I use Macro Factor as well, right? The Stronger by Science guys. And the same thing, they have a Reddit and a Facebook group and they're like, they got their roadmap planned out and everything and listening to, to folks. So as long as you're doing that, we know it's going to improve even if there's things that people might have frustrations with now. And, and that's, that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, the tough balance to juggle here is we're catered to both lifting enthusiasts and also complete beginners. Mm -hmm. So yep. when you talk about lifting enthusiasts, especially those that are coming from like a spreadsheet, you need to have the advanced functionalities for them to create and edit programs as they would in like a Google Sheet. But then if you have all those functionalities laid out, then it's going to be extremely confusing to beginners who just want to get started working out. They for don't sure. want to be learning a brand new technology. So... That's always like the, the struggle, you know, when we think about the UI, UX of the app, when we have requests from people, like, you know, we have some requests from users on like really advanced analytics, right? Or like a really niche feature that maybe 0.1% of people will actually use, you know, is that something that's more worthwhile developing versus another thing that, you know, it's more simple, that benefits more people. And so it's always a struggle to try to figure out like, okay, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? What do, like we just launched something like for a swap exercise that helps a small niche of prog a, a small niche of programs, but negatively impacts other programs. Oh yeah, that happens, right? When you do an upgrade and people are like, "What happened to this thing I, I relied on all this time? It went away." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, what we thought was like going to be improvement. And it is improvement for certain use cases is actually a detriment in the other use cases. Interesting. So they're just like. So many different, um, so many different demographics that you know we got to think about, and uh, you know when you push out an update now, it's going out to you know hundreds of thousands of people. So it's something sure. that uh, you know as we scale, we have to be very thoughtful in terms of what comes out, what doesn't come out, how do we prioritize different features and different designs. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes the features there and the user just takes a little more playing around to find it. You know, sometimes there's like secret menus too. I don't think yours has a lot of those, but I'm going to, I'll talk to you offline about one thing I'm thinking of and, and see if you could tell me how to do it differently. Cause it could be me. <laughs> okay, so it's yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a minor thing. Again, I love the app. I think this is awesome. I think the way that like the, on your, on your landing page, it says like the best app for, for lifters. And when I first saw that, I'm like, that's a, that's a bold claim to make. Cause there are a million apps out there. But the fact that as a lifter myself, it does the things I want it to do. And, and maybe there's competitive apps that do that as well. You're on the right, you're on the right path. And, and I'm happy to, you know, shout, shout it from the rooftops and recommend you, you guys. Should. So those listening right now, again, it sounds kind of like an infomercial, but it's because it's a helpful app and you're trying to lift and get Jack Swole, Strong, Lean, whatever the, the word is you like to use, you know, go download the app. And um, I'll, I'll throw the links into the subreddit as well. I think that'd be cool. Uh, Boost Camp itself and uh, anywhere else you want people to find you. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say the the website and the subreddit are, uh, you know, the two places where uh, we're most active. Cool. So yeah, I recommend you check out the website and play around with the different filters to look at different programs. You know, we talked earlier about the community programs, which I think, you know, there's some pretty hilarious programs out there uh, that people are creating and publishing. You know, we're, we're definitely thinking about better ways to display new programs as well, incentivize users to create more programs. You know, we have, I think we've done a pretty good job so far with like the product building and making the app useful, but I, I still think we're very early on in terms of our ultimate vision of, um, you know, making, uh, you know, the best lifting app out there. Awesome, man. And honestly, one of the best things I learned about you today before we recorded was this is your first podcast as a guest appearance, which I'm very happy to have you on, right? Is that right? First, yeah. and it shows that you're like a guy behind the scenes that just wants to get it done. You're not necessarily out there to just, you know, promote an app. So I think that speaks volumes. Thanks, man, for coming on. It was, it was definitely a lot of fun. I, I think the listeners get a lot from the show. Yeah, no, thanks for being a great host, preparing the great questions. Uh, you made the uh, the first podcast appearance very easy. Cool, awesome, awesome, awesome. Except I told you uh, I had a f something in the app that needs to be fixed. Shouldn't have done that, because honestly, I love the oh, app. No, so. please, please. No, no, I mean, there's, we get tons of emails about tons of things that need to be fixed. So it's I'm no, sure, I'm it's, sure. <laughs> I'm, no, uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm no stranger to that. Cool, man. All right, thanks for coming on. Okay, thanks, Philip. Great chatting.